السلام عليكم مرحبا بكم جميعا في هذا اللقاء الثاني من سلسلة على أكتاف العمالقة on the shoulders of giants التي نستضيف فيها كبار علماء الفيزياء في مختلف الاختصاصات والمجالات ضيفنا اليوم أحد الكبار علماء نظرية الأوتار الفائقة السوبر سترينج ثيوري هو كاميران فافا فيزيائي نظري من العامية على تطوير نظرية الأوتار الفائقة حصل على الشهادة الجامعية في الرياضيات والفيزياء من معهد ماساتشوستس للتقانة ام اي تي ونال شهادة الدكتوراه من جامعة برينستون تحت اشراف العالم الكبير ادوارد ويتن. طور نظرية في الفيزياء تحمل الاسم اف ثيوري التي تعد تعديلا على نظام نظرية الاوتار الفائقة او احدى نسخ نظرية الاوتار الفائقة. يهتم كثيرا بمعنى المثنوية الوترية سترينج دواليتي والتي سنتعرف على بعض افكارها اليوم في لقائنا معكم ان شاء الله. نال دكتور غافا العديد من الجوائز اخرها جائزه الانجازات في الفيزياء الاساسيه بريك ثرو برايز ان فاندمنتال فيزكس عن اسامته في تطوير نظريه الاوتار الفائقه كما نال جائزه مركز عبد السلام الدولي للفيزياء النظريه عبد السلام انترناشونال سنتر فور ثيوريتيكال فيزكس وايضا حصل على ميداليه ديراك ديراك ميدال له العديد من المؤلفات اخرها الغاز لكشف اسرار الكون بازلز تو انرابل ذا يونيفرس وغيره من الكتب التخصصيه والعديد من الابحاث والاوراق العلميه. لقاؤنا اليوم سيتمحور حول الالغاز التي نسعى من خلالها لكشف اسرار الكون. نرحب بكم مره اخرى مع الدكتور بافا. So I can start I believe is that right? Yes. yes. Uh, so uh, thank you for the kind introduction and uh, it's a great pleasure. I'm uh, grateful that you have invited me to give a talk to my uh, to my Arab friends. It's a great opportunity. Uh, COVID has been bad for many reasons, but at least in this respect, I'm happy to be able to use this possibility to connect with with, uh, with my Arab friends who have had uh, not as much chance to interact. Uh, so um, I'm going to talk about a, a piece of part of kind of a general topic about connections between puzzles and physics. Mm -hmm. And um, this is going to be based on a, uh, a work I've done, uh, based on a course I've been teaching at Harvard for the past 10 years. And the course is, um, is, uh, has led to a book on this, but by the same name, Puzzles to Unravel the Universe is the name of the, of the, of the book it's, uh, itself. So, um, so I'm going to talk about some aspects of this. And the basic idea is the following. I'm going to be trying to explain why simple mathematical ideas, easy math, can nevertheless be teaching us about fundamental aspects of physics. Physics sometimes has a reputation to be complicated, mathematically complicated, and so on. But it is not. And here my aim is to show you some examples where simple ideas of physics can be, or which are very important and basic, can be illustrated by simple ideas of mathematics. Uh, in, so this talk is aimed for non-specialists. It's not aimed for physicists, it's for the public. In two weeks, I'm gonna give a, another talk, which is gonna be aimed for the specialist, namely physicists, about more recent, more modern topics that has happened in the context of physics, which is gonna be much more technical than the talk I'm gonna give give you. So this talk is going to be non-technical. So first I'm going to review some connections between math and physics and math and physics have had a beautiful uh, history of interactions over many thousands of years. And some examples of them involve the uh, Greek mathematicians and philosophers who described the relations between math and geometry uh, and the relation possibly to explaining nature. They talk about uh, uh, platonic solids where they thought that these solids, these special solids could describe the different elements of the world like air, earth, fire, water, and the universe. Uh, and so they were always trying to connect good, nice ideas of mathematics to physics. This tradition continued by ancient Indian mathematicians and Chinese mathematicians and all over the world, but also in particular by Islamic scientists. And this tradition continued. For example, Al-Biruni studied aspects of the connections between the radius of the earth and simple geometry 
by simply going on top of a mountain and measuring the deviation of the angle from a horizontal angle where you see the horizon and the horizontal angle to find uh, the radius of the earth. And he got one of the most accurate measurements of the earth at that time. The tradition continued by other scientists. And for example, the work of uh, Ibn Mu'az and also Al-Hassan Ibn Al-Haysam, where they tried to measure the atmosphere's height. I mean, when we talk about the atmosphere today, you might think, how do we know what's its height? Well, you think maybe they, they, they sent a satellite up there to see where the air finishes, but that's not actually the first time it was measured. And the first time it was understood was about a thousand years ago. Uh, and it was, the idea was simply the following. Uh, the idea was that when, the, when, when you have a, suppose you live up here and suppose you have a sunset. So when the sun sets, as soon as it goes down below your sight, you cannot see the sun anymore. However, the sky above you does not get dark quickly. It takes a while. Now, why does it take a while? The reason is that the sun, if it's for example here, it still shines on the, on the air above you. And so the air above you reflects the sun, the, the light down to you. And you see this twilight, that you see this light still coming to you. So you don't, it doesn't look dark. However, after a while, when the sun comes further down, the light cannot even reach the top part of your atmosphere. And beyond this point, it doesn't hit any part of your atmosphere. And therefore you cannot see any, any part of the sky and it's totally dark. So it takes a while for the sunset to this point and how long it takes will depend on what's the height of the atmosphere. So they use how long it took for the light to go completely dark, the sky to be completely dark, to measure the height of the atmosphere. Very brilliant idea. So this tradition continued uh, in the Western world by Newton, uh, where he invented calculus and used that to describe the laws of mechanics. And uh, later Gauss, who's a mathematician, uh, began contemplating new kinds of geometries in the context of uh, non Euclidean geometry, where the angles didn't add up to 180 degrees for a triangle. And so, for example, he was pondering questions like if you go to the top of the mountains and you measure these angles, would they add up to 180 or not? And these kind of questions had to wait later when, when uh, uh, more modern times to get applied to physics. Maxwell, again, uh, used amazingly elegant mathematical formulas to describe electricity and magnetism. And by doing so, by writing these in terms of elegant mathematical equations, the differential equations, he managed to describe how the light works and how electricity and magnetism propagate uh, and move with the speed of light and therefore describing how the light works. Uh, Riemann, this time again a mathematician, was wondering if geometry can be used to unify electricity and magnetism with gravity. Einstein showed that Riemannian geometry in three spatial and one time direction can be used to describe gravitational forces. The idea was that if you have a planet, for example, Earth, it curves the space around it. So the, the space is not flat anymore. It's kind of like curvy. And when the objects are moving around it, it will, it will follow some kind of a curved path because of that. And that's the reason for gravity. So the gravity became a geometric phenomenon. Kaluza and Klein noticed that they can use Einstein's theory in one higher dimension. If you increase the number of spatial direction from three to four by adding an extra circle as one more dimension, then they manage to unify electricity and magnetism with gravity. So the idea of extra geometries and unification of forces in physics began to take hold by Kaluza and Klein's work. My area of research is string theory. String theory is a branch of theoretical physics which has come to prominence in the past 50 years and it has been growing ever since it was, it was uh, started to be discussed in the late 60s, early 70s. And it has become 1970s and it has become the, basically the most uh, a developed theory, fundamental theory of nature. And the aim of string theory is to unify fundamental forces and particles into one framework. All the forces and all the particles are unified into string, in one string. 
and it aims to describe physics from the smallest possible scales, a three length of a three length of the size of an atom, all the way to the size of the entire universe. And the basic postulate is that fundamental particles are not point-like. They're not just like one point, like what you might think, but actually like a string and they extend its size. They have a size like a one dimensional object. So you replace objects which are like uh, fundamental particles like quarks by extended objects. So they are, the, the, they are not actually point-like, but actually if you zoom in to these things that you think they are point, they are not, and they become like strings. And what string theory does is that it resolves an inconsistency between Einstein's theory of gravity and quantum mechanics. So quantum mechanics and Einstein theory had a, had a, had a problem together, but if you replace particles and graviton in particular, the particle which mediates gravitational force by strings, then the inconsistency is gone. So, so the strings, when they join, they become one string. And this joining and splitting of strings is the reason strings exert force on each other. So this is the origin of force. So for geometrical picture like this, explains electricity and magnetism, explains gravitational force and all the other forces we know. This area of physics is very mathematical and it involves many abstract ideas. Dimension of space is more than three plus one. Indeed, instead of three spatial dimension, you have nine spatial dimensions. There are six extra dimensions. And the shape and the size of these tiny six dimensions affect what we see in our universe. And they are assumed to be tiny. Strings wrapped around these tiny dimensions lead to insights about how black holes work and, and how the beginning of the universe looks like. So you can think about these extra dimensions as these tiny spheres that are hard to see, but, uh, but are there, uh, but they're so tiny. So this was the basic introduction for what are, what's going on in modern physics today. But my aim in this talk is the following. I want to show you that highly mathematical aspects of string theory is typical of many attempts to connect physics with reality. And the question would be, can we illustrate this connection between physics and math by simpler ideas? So here in this talk, I will give you a number of examples where simple ideas from mathematics can shed light on physics. And what is, what is more fun to do than to use simple puzzles um, or muammas? So let's go with the muamma. Uh, symmetry and conservation law. So look at this. You have two containers, one green and one white. You fill a glass with a green container. You put it into the white container. And then you stir it. And after you stir it, you take the same, same amount of fluid from the second one and you put it back into the first one. And then you stir it. Okay, so now here you have mixtures. Now the white is not purely white, it has some green and the green is not purely green, it has some white. So, so I hope that, is, that point is clear. So now the question I want to ask is, do we know which one of these, which one of these have, um, which one of these is more, uh, is more uh, pure? Is, does the green have more white or the white has more green? So which container has the highest concentration of the other color? So uh, okay. I want you to say, if you, think, if you think green has more white, say G. If you think white has more green in it, say W okay. in the chat. So can I translate the puzzle? Yes. Yes. Okay. لدينا وعاء آن. الأول كان فيه لون أخضر فقط والآخر فيه سائل بلون أبيض فقط. أخذنا كوب من السائل الأخضر وأضفناه إلى الوعاء الذي يحوي السائل الأبيض. ثم أخذنا نفس القدر نفس الحجم تماما. من نفس الوعاء الذي يحوي اللون الأبيض بعد أن امتزج بشيء من اللون الأخضر وأعدناه إلى الوعاء الذي كان يحتوي اللون الأخضر السؤال أي الوعاءين يحوي 
تركيزا اعلى من اللون الاخضر من اللون الاخر اسف هل الوعاء الاخضر يحوي كميه من اللون الابيض اكثر من ما يحوي الوعاء الابيض من اللون الاخضر ام بالعكس نرجو الاجابه ان كنت ان كنت تظن ان الوعاء الاخضر يحوي لون ابيض اكثر ممكن الاجابه بي جي على مربع الشات ان كان الوعاء الابيض يحوي لون اخضر اكثر ممكن نجيب بحرف دبليو واذا كان متساويا دكتور بافا سم اودينس انسرينج وات اف ذي ار ايكوال سو وي كان ذي انسر باي ايكوال ساين يس اوكي ذي ثينك ار ايكوال ذي كان بوت ايكوال اف ذي ثينك ذا وايت هاز مور جرين ذي شود ساي دبليو Okay. If they say green has more white, they should say G. Okay. So, لذلك إذا عنا ثلاثة إجابات إما أن نجيب بW إن كان الوعاء الأبيض يحوي أكثر G إن كان الوعاء الأخضر يحوي أكثر من اللون الآخر وإذا متساويان فممكن وضع إشارة المساواة. Okay. So I think we have gotten basically the answers. Um, many people say W and some have said equal. Exactly. And let me say why the why no, answer by green. Sorry? No one answered green. No one answered green, exactly. So let me explain why, why you might, one might think that the white has more green in it. The reason is simple, because when you took the glass from the green container, you took pure green and you put it in the white. But when you took that same container, you mix it up, you take the same glass and put it back in, now you're not taking pure white. It's not khalis, <laughs> you're taking a mixture. Therefore, you're taking back some and putting it back in the other one. So you might say, aha, uh -huh, I'm getting some of the white back to the green and the, some of the green also back to the green. So therefore, you might think that the original one, the green is more pure in the first one. So therefore, the white has more green in it. That would, that would be the motivation for answering that W is the answer. However, however, surprisingly, the answer is that they are equal. And, and to see that, it basically uses symmetry and conservation law. So this is the basic point of the, the, this whole puzzle. This puzzle might confuse us, but we should not think about, first of all, there's a left-right symmetry. The green and white are exactly the same size to begin with. And you would think about the total volume as, as, the, as the conservation of the volumes. You start with the amount of volume which are equal, And when you take some volume from one to the other, the total final volume is also equal. But the total volume of the green should be somewhere. So whatever is missing from this green, it should be in white. And whatever is, in, whatever is, is missing from the white should be in green. And by the conservation of the volume and the symmetry, you immediately deduce that they are equal. And so to see that, you can unmix them. And whatever is missing from the green must be white. And whatever is missing from the white must be green. And of course, if you switch them over, you get back what you had. So of course, they have the same amount of uh, volume. So that's the first puzzle. So this is an example of showing symmetry and conservation laws. Conservation laws for physics is crucial, and it might appear like it's boring, but it's not. As you can see, even this simple application of it can deconfuse us about the mistake we would make because it looks complicated. But going back to the principle of conservation can shed light. So you can also think of it this way. Suppose you have two decks of cards, 10 red and 10 black. You can take three of the red cards and put it in the black pile and then shuffle it. And then you can then take three cards back from this one and put it back to the red one and shuffle it. So this is similar to the green and the white paints. And then the question is, does the green, does the red pile have more black cards or the black one has more red ones? And of course, they clearly are equal because, um, because there are 10 cards to begin with and then 10 cards at the end. So whatever is missing from the red pile must be here and whatever is missing from this one should be there. So of course, they're going to be equal. And that's just another way of thinking about this puzzle. So let me give you another example of a conservation law. Aristotle thought that heavier objects fall faster. Like if you take a big stone, it will fall faster to the ground. But uh, Galileo said, no, all objects fall at the same rate. 
So this was something he had done experiments and he had shown he had gone famously on top of the Pisa tower. He had gone on top of the Pisa tower and he had seen that when he dropped heavier and the lighter stones, they fall at the same time. But people at that time were not convinced. They told him you should explain it to us why it has to be because Aristotle, the great, great, great scientist had told us or great philosopher had already told us that heavier and lighter objects should be different and heavy should fall first and then the light. So, Aris, so Galileo had to come up with a reason so that everybody would understand and agree with him. Not just the experiment. Experiment somehow at that time was not enough to convince them. So he came up with a brilliant symmetry argument, the following. He said, suppose we have three bricks. If you take three bricks and you drop them from the same height, which one would fall to the ground first? Well, they fall at the same time. Why? Because of symmetry. They're at the same height. The bricks have the same mass. And so therefore by symmetry, they should all hit the ground at the same time. Okay, now remember that the, the height is what matters. They didn't have to be exactly spaced next to each other. So for example, we could do, we could get two of them closer and then drop it. Of course, it does not matter whether you bring them closer or not, as long as they're at the same height, they still fall at the same rate. And so Galileo then took this last brilliant step. He said, okay, so you agree that it does not matter how close they are, so I can bring them as close as I want and they could kind of touch each other. And then they will still fall at the same rate, right? Yes, of course, why not? This should be the same. It doesn't matter what height they are. But then he said, uh-huh, this was twice bigger than this one. So this is now twice more massive than this brick. And you agreed that they fall at the same rate. So again, the symmetry principle here tells us that the heavier and the lighter objects fall at the same rate. So this was kind of his explanation and confused, deconfuse us to not think that heavier and lighter objects behave differently. So it was a brilliant idea to try to convince people. Now, the next topic is what is called spontaneous symmetry breaking. I was telling you how important symmetry is, but breaking the symmetry is even more important and more interesting in many ways. So let me illustrate this by a puzzle. So this is my puzzle to you. We have four cities, A, B, C, D, and these four cities are on the corners of a square. So A, B, C, and D are the corners of a square and Morabba, in other words, and we take, we, we, we try to ask the following question. We want to find a highway system which connects these cities together, which gives you the shortest total length. You don't need necessarily to go directly from any, every city to every other city, as long as there is a way to get from one city to any other city, by your highway system, that's fine. So the question is, how do you design the highway system so it is the minimal total length for the highway? Okay, is the question clear? Does it need translation or not? Okay, uh, I will translate. لدينا أربع مدن موجودة على شكل مربع نحتاج لتصميم طريق يصل المدن الأربعة مع بعضها. الطريق يجب أن يكون أقصر ما يمكن. بحيث يسمح بالوصول من أي مدينة إلى مدينة أخرى ليس بالضرورة أن يكون الوصول مباشرا ولكن المهم أن يكون يوجد طريق من A إلى B أو D أو C وبحيث يكون الطريق بالمجمل أقصر ما يمكن Okay So who, those of you who think this is the answer say why those who don't think this is the answer say N in the chat how many of you think this is the answer to the shortest path? If you think this is the answer, put Y in the chat. If you think this is not the answer, put N. Yes, yeah, sorry. Can I translate? Yes. Okay. If you think that the correct solution is written on the screen, you can answer yes. Or the answer is yes. Okay. 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 والذي يعتقد أن هذا الحل خطأ ممكن أن يجيب ب N اختصاراً لـ No. 
We have about five years, but no knows yet. No knows. Okay. 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 Uh, you might also think of this one. This is also symmetric. Actually, it turns out that neither this nor the previous one are the correct answers. You might think that, for example, this one, you can delete one of the sides and it's still going to be able to get from any city to any other city. But actually, or, or move this down or up, it doesn't matter that you can still get from any city to any other city. But it turns out that the best path is this. This is the shortest answer. And you go from A to, you make a street like this where they, they make an angle of 120 degrees and you connect it like this and this makes a 120 degree angle also. And this is the shortest path for the highway. It is surprising. Now, why is this surprising? The reason it's surprising is that it breaks the symmetry, you see? If you want to go from city A to city C, you just go from here to here and then to here. And if you want to, want to go from city A to city B, you have to go here and then here and then there. So the city from A to B is longer by this much. Even though the distance from A to B and A to C are equal. So the highway system breaks the symmetry, breaks it spontaneously, in other words, just by looking for the shortest path, you find that there's a better answer for the one you had given, and this is the shortest answer. Of course, there's another short answer, which is going like A and B first, and then going the other way like this, but both of these solutions break the symmetry of the square to a smaller symmetry. So in fact, the idea of symmetry and symmetry breaking was very much in the minds of the early Greek philosophers. You see, they had already, they were very smart and they had already found out that earth is round. And at the center, they, and, but they thought incorrectly that the earth is also at the center of the universe. And then moreover, they thought that the earth is at the center and, and it's not moving because they didn't think that it didn't look like things around them are moving. And they wanted to explain why isn't the earth moving? So they said, well, if you take the earth and it's the center of the universe, if it is to move in some direction like that, something funny happens. You see, originally you had this spherical symmetric situation and the earth was at the center, but at the, by the very act of moving, you're breaking the symmetry because you're picking a direction. Picking a direction breaks the rotational symmetry. So they said, because of symmetry, Earth cannot move. And that's why Earth is not moving. So that was their argument to try to understand why Earth is not moving, is that they said it would break the symmetry. But Aristotle, Aristotle was smart enough to see that this is not a good argument. And his point was that sometimes breaking the symmetry is preferred. So he's, he tried to explain it in the following way. He said, suppose, suppose you are at the center of a circle and you put bread around you on a circle and then you wait. Are you going to move or not? If you do not move, you will die from starvation. Therefore, for you to be able to, for you to be able to uh, survive, you break the symmetry and move. So therefore, you, if you're at the center of the circle, you don't care to just not to break symmetry, you decide to move and get the bread. And you don't care that you're breaking the symmetry and that's fine. In other words, having food is the preferred situation. And this is an example of spontaneous symmetry breaking. 
the rotational symmetry of the circle is broken by this person picking out one of the breads. <coughs> In fact, spontaneous symmetry breaking is on our bodies. You can look at yourself and your body reflects spontaneous symmetry breaking. You see, we, li we live on a flat, generally flat plane, and the flat plane has a 360 degree rotational symmetry. You can go around and generally speaking, on the average, there's no difference between any different direction. However, your eyes are only in the front and not all over your head. In other words, your eyes is not circularly symmetric like this. So your body spontaneously breaks the symmetry and it is not just in the front. Now you might ask, why did our body not get eyes all over the circle? Why our body has only picked one direction? Why is the spontaneous symmetry breaking on our body? Well, evolution must have, must have come up with a system that this is a better way to have, to, to allocate resources and it's better for us to have only the eyes in the front. Why? Well, for the same reason we were talking about. Because if you're going after the food, you want to know where the food is. So your eye should be in the front and you want to go towards it. So therefore, spontaneous symmetry breaking is part of what happens in our body. So our body knows about spontaneous symmetry breaking. Now you might ask, why are we talking about this? This is so boring. It's nothing to do with physics. Actually, it has a lot to do with physics. In fact, modern physics has many applications of symmetry breaking. For example, the superconductivity. The reason superconductors are is because of spontaneous symmetry breaking. Another example is the, the discovery of a particle called the Higgs particle. And the way we think about it in modern physics is that there is a potential like this, and the, the, the minimum of the potential is not at the center, but farther away. So therefore, if you want to be at a lower height, which is the preferred position, lower energy, you will go down over here and you break the symmetry. It turns out that the Higgs particle corresponds precisely to the position down the hill here. And the oscillations of this correspond to the, what we call the Higgs particle. And the fact that we have mass, every particle like electrons, protons, and everything we are made of have mass is because we are not at the center. If you put this back at the center, our mass goes to zero. So therefore, this is an important principle for modern physics to describe how things work, the idea of spontaneous symmetry breaking. Now, uh, I want to give you examples of why simple mathematics could be very powerful. So you might think simple math cannot be that interesting, should be very boring, and I want to convince you otherwise. Suppose you take the earth and imagine this equator around the earth. So wrap a belt, wrap a belt around the equator and then open it up. So we take this belt and then we open it up. So the next thing we do, we add one meter. Right here, we added one meter to the length of the uh, to the length of this uh, of this belt, and then we wrap it again. How much do you think? How much do you think it's going to rise above the Earth? Because now it's going to be extra length, so it's not going to be tight anymore. How much do you think is going to rise above the earth? For those of you who think it's going to be less than one centimeter, say L. And those who think it's going to be more than one centimeter, say M for more. So L for less and M for more. Is, it going to, is X less than one centimeter or more than one centimeter? Okay. Do you want to translate this? Yes. Uh, if we had a habit, وحطنا بمحيط الكرة الأرضية بعدين الحبل هذا زدنا طوله بمقدار متر فإذا الخيط أو الحبل بطول محيط الكرة الأرضية ثم زدنا طول هذا الخيط بمقدار واحد متر أعدنا لف هذا الخيط حول الكرة الأرضية طبعا حيكون 
اطول من محيط الكره الارضيه وبالتالي حيكون في ارتفاع مقدار هذا الارتفاع اللي رمزنا له بالصوره بالحرف اكس هل هو اقل من 1 سم ام اكثر من 1 سم من يعتقد انه اقل من 1 سم ممكن يجاوب بحرف ال لس واللي بيعتقد انه هي اكثر حتكون الارتفاع اكثر من 1 سم ممكن يجاوب ب ام مور So the majority answering L. Okay, so the majority okay, thing is less. And in fact, that's understandable because you would think that the earth is so big and you added one meter, you haven't done much. So it's going to be barely noticeable that you did anything. Uh, but actually it turns out the answer is 16 centimeters. And the mathematics is relatively simple. You see, the original radius of the earth is R and the circumference of the earth is two pi r, simple mathematics. So you add one meter to it, and that's gonna be the new circumference. So it's gonna be two pi times r plus x. So if you take two pi r plus two pi x, the two pi r cancels from both sides, and you get two pi x is one. And you solve for x is one over two pi, which is approximately 16 centimeters. It is surprising that it is this, uh, it is this, uh, it is this uh, big, but as you can see, this mathematics is almost trivial. It's a simple mathematics. So sometimes even simple mathematics can, can deconfuse us and get us the right answer. So even primary school children can do this mathematics, but, but the answer is not is surprising even for them. Okay, now I have another question for you. You see, I could also pull this all the way from one side so that it's tight on one end and the belt is farther out. And then I can pull X a little more. How many people think I can, I can when I do this, X is gonna be more than one meter. How many think it's going to be less than one meter? So the question is, if I, I, if I pull it only on one side, so it's not equally raised above the equator. So one side is pulled. So the other part will touch the earth, but one side is pulled away then how big is X gonna get? Is it less than one meter or more than one meter? Now I'm talking about meter. Victor, you mean- So those uh, who think it's gonna be, mm -hmm. yes, please go ahead with the question. Uh, you mean the same rope that it has one extra a meter? Yes, the same rope, mm -hmm. we just pull it so that it, yes. you can pull on one side. So it's not equally distributed, it's not equally rising above the earth. On okay. the left side is touching the earth and the right side is above the earth, more. Mm -hmm. What do you think X is going to be now? What's the maximum you're going to get now? Is it going to be less than one meter or more than one meter? Do you okay. want to translate that? Okay. الحمل السابق اللي نحن كان جعلنا طوله أكثر من طول محيط الكرة الأرضية بواحد متر. الآن ما رح نوزعه بتساوي أو بشكل متناسق على حول الكرة الأرضية. نما رح نجعله من طرف ملامس للكرة الأرضية ومن طرف آخر رح نحاول نشده الأقصى ما يمكن. يعني حنجمع طول الزائد كله بطرف واحد. الآن السؤال كم حيبلغ ارتفاع أو الزيادة في طول الخيط أو الحبل من هذا الطرف؟ هذا المقدار المشار له باللون الأخضر في الرسمة. إذا كم حيكون طول أو بعد الحبل عن الأرض من طرف واحد؟ هل حيكون أكثر من متر أم أقل من متر؟ اللي جاوبه أكثر ممكن يجاوب بحرف M more واللي جاوبه أقل ممكن يجاوب بحرف L less. We still wait some more answers. Okay, بس عم ننتظر شوية إجابات أكثر عنا القليل اللي شارك لحد الآن. Okay, so it seems like most of you say it's less. Yes. But at least one person said more, so let me continue. How many think this is going to be more than 100 meters? Wow. Say M, and how about less than 100 meters? Put L. الآن تحدي جديد. <laughs> من يعتقد أن الزيادة هذه ستبلغ 100 متر أو أكثر من 100 متر أو أقل من 100 متر؟ الآن الإجابة على السؤال الجديد أكثر من 100 متر أم أقل من 100 متر؟ Whoever thinks it's going to be more than 100 meter put M. Whoever thinks it's less than 100 meter put L. Nobody's answering. Okay. Somebody's saying more than 100 meter. A few people are saying more than 100 meter. So remember, we only added one meter to the length of the rope. 
They, okay. they came suspicious. That's why they choose more than 100 meters. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're, you're right to be suspicious because the answer <laughs> turns out to be 121 meters. Amazing. So, so, and why is this? Well, it's surprising, but I'll leave it to you as an exercise. If you have studied uh, calculus, then you can do this kind of exercise and you find it's surprising, but it's 121 meters. So, so even kind of a boring math give us very surprising results. And so, so I will, I will, um, I will encourage you to think about this for those who know a bit more math. Another example I want to talk about is the simple notion and one of the powerful ideas of mathematics is continuity. The power of continuity. So let me go back to the earth. Here it's again equator. And suppose we measure the temperature on the equator. And we are asking, could it be that, that at any moment, of course the temperature varies over the equator, it's not the same temperature, the temperature changes over it. Could it be that no matter how it's changing, at any moment, two temperatures opposite across the center of the earth have nevertheless have the same temperature? In other words, could, I, could we have a situation that at any moment there are two points which have identical temperatures? How many people think the answer to this question is yes, and how many people think the answer is no? The ones who think the answer is yes, put Y, and the ones who think the answer is no, put N. Uh, I think some of the audience start to think against our common sense. Okay, so, so some people say no, some people say yes. Yes. Okay, so it turns out that the answer is that there always are at least two points opposite. Uh, which have the same uh, which have the same temperature, and the way you see it is the following: Suppose you take two of these points, and suppose the temperatures are not equal. Then consider the function, which is the difference of these temperatures. If this is zero, if this f is zero, that means the temperatures are equal. But suppose it's not zero, then it's positive. But notice that if you change, go from this point all the way to here. If you go to the opposite point, you get a minus sign because this temperature minus this temperature becomes this temperature minus the other one. So you, got, you switch the roles. So if you take this function, it starts, if it's not zero, let's say it's positive here or negative here, it goes to positive here. But temperature is a continuous function. And therefore, if you start from a negative value and you end up with a positive value, at some point you must cross zero. And whenever you cross zero, that is the point where the temperatures are equal because that function was a difference of temperatures. So this shows that the simple idea of continuity, which is one of the key cornerstones of physics, the laws of physics always give you continuous answers. The fact that you get continuous answer means that the temperatures at opposite points, there are always at least two opposite points for which the temperatures are equal. This shows that the power of continuity and topology in the context of physics. Some of the things that we see again and again in modern physics, these kind of ideas being important. It turns out that actually, there's something even more interesting. If you take the whole earth, and if you look at not only the temperature, but also the pressure, there are always at least two points exactly opposite of each other for which the temperature and pressure, both the temperature and pressure are exactly equal. So it's quite remarkable that this is the case. I'll give you another example of the power of continuity. And this one is example uses what's called the gravitational lenses. You see, um, as I was explaining to you, Einstein's theory of relativity tells you that the space time is curved. And what that does is that the light 
sometimes can don't go over the straight path, but can kind of curve. So if you have, for example, a galaxy here, and if we are here at the earth, the light will pass, pass through different paths. And so if you are over here, you can see this object in two different directions, one here and one the other direction. So you think that two different objects are there, but actually they are the same. So the galaxy will have multiple images, one, two, or whatever number of ways the rays get to you. So the question I have is the following. Um, well, before I, I say that, I will give you another example. This is an actual picture of the, of the sky. And over here, I'm zooming in, you see these objects, you see these blue things, and you see these, uh, these orange things. These blue things are quasars, and these orange things are galaxies. And you think you have a number of galaxies and a number of quasars because of the fact that you, you don't know if they are the same or not, but it actually, it turns out that these five blue circles over here, these are actually the same quasar and these orange ones are the same galaxy. So you have three images of the same galaxy and five images of the same quasar. And this is an, a, a beautiful example of gravitational lensing. Now you might ask, why did we get three and five? Why did we get odd number of images? Is it always odd? Are the number of images we get always odd, like one, three, five, or not? This is a fact. It turns out that the number of gravitational images, if no image is blocked, is always odd. Just less than half of them are inverted images. So in other words, you always have odd number of images and just less than half are inverted. For example, if you have three images, you get two images, which is right side up, but one of them, which is inverted. If you have five images, you have three of them, which is right side up, but two of them, which are inverted. So you get just less than half of them are inverted. This is one of the facts of Einstein's theory. And you might ask, how do you see this? Can you actually prove this? How do you prove this? You might think it's a very complicated thing, but it turns out again to be a result of continuity of the laws of physics. And the way it works is that if you look at the image of the galaxy, star or galaxy, you just look at the light rays that come towards you. So imagine, imagine here you're at the earth and here's a galaxy or star or whatever you're observing. And each light that passes through, uh, passes through this uh, small sphere surrounding the star will get to this big sphere, which is next to where we are. These are of course, imaginary spheres, these blue ones. The center of both of these spheres is the original uh, galaxy. So each light will hit this at one point and it will hit this at another point. So it hits here and here. So it gives you a map from a two dimensional sphere, this is a S2, the sphere which is centered here to the sphere which is near the earth, passes by the earth. <coughs> now, <clears throat> it turns out that uh, if you look at one of the image points here, the number of pre-images is one. And that's because if there's just straight lines, there's only one image. Now the net number of images of a given point counted with a plus or minus sign it's called the degree of the map, <coughs> excuse me. So the degree of the map from the sphere to the sphere is one when there's nothing in between them. So that's because every point has only one pre-image. So if you have an image on the, if you have a point on a big sphere, there's only one point on the first sphere that went to it. And that gives you the degrees map is one. But the degree of the map is a topological thing cannot jump. It cannot jump from one to two to three. So how could you get any other number? Well, the way it happens is the following. Suppose this is the earth. If there is nothing in between us, you only get straight lines. But if you put matter in between, 
it is somewhat the key to changing the geometry of the sphere if you have a matter, but the degree is still one. So you see if you, the degree of them is just, you just get from this image, there's only one. But if you move the earth, then instead of being here, you might end up farther down like here, in which case you will see that, well, it's still one. But if you go further down, you will see th three. So because the direction is changing. And then next one, you on, go to the over here, you get again, more, more of these. So, um, so let me just do this again, just to see it. So you have here one, and the next one you see again, three. And finally you get, um, if you give it more, you get five. Again, three of them are plus and two are minus because the minuses are going in the opposite direction. Now here, I want to tell you about the power of mathematical abstraction. Sometimes you have to use abstract concepts in mathematics. And I'm gonna give you an example. The example I'm gonna give you is the example of four ants. So we have four ants moving on a plane. They go with constant velocity, but in different directions and different speeds. So each one is going with a constant speed, but different speeds and different directions. And they collide. As the ants move, they collide. So, so there are four ants and every pair of them, when they move, they collide. Like this collided, the one and three collided, the ants, two and three collided, three and four collided, two and four collided, and one and four collided. The question is, do these two ants, the ants one and two, do they also collide? So do you want to translate this problem? So whoever thinks the ants, the ants will collide, put Y for yes. And the ones who think the ants won't collide, don't have to collide, put N for no. Okay. Would you like to answer the question? Yes, sure. Thank you. So I have four numbers that are in different directions and in different directions. Now, some of the numbers are collided or collided or collided and collided and collided in a certain point. The question is, is it possible to collide النملات المتبقية عدة أزواج تلاقت في نقطة معينة هل الزوج الأخير أيضا من المحتم أن يتلاقوا في نقطة واحدة؟ Okay, so many people said yes and many people said no and it turns out the answer is not obvious from the doing it I mean to, to try to do the calculation might be hard but actually there is an abstraction helps us to solve this problem. And the answer is that they will always collide. But to do this, to, to show that they actually collide, the easiest way to do it is using abstract mathematics. And so the idea is to use the notion of space and time. So you have to add the time as a dimension. You see here, we are talking about the plane. So you have a two dimensional plane but then you want to add an extra direction, which is time. Since ants are going with a constant speed, that means if you draw them where the ants are at a given time, they look like a straight line in the space time, which is not three dimensional. There are two space and one time direction. So the ants will go on a straight line, each one of them. Now, since the ants are going in different directions, as soon as they collide, since they collide pass through the same point at the same time, it means that these lines that you're drawing at the same time you pass from the same point. So that means these ants lines will collide each other also in two plus one dimension. So adding time as an extra direction, as an extra dimension, they will still, the lines will pass through each other. So we have now four lines, one for each ant and pairs, each pair of the ants collide. So the, the, if, three, if three of these lines collide, then they must form a plane. So if you have two different planes which share three lines, then they must be the same plane. And from that, we can deduce that they, the other ones will have to collide. So in other words, we add the time as an extra direction. And this is what will happen. So think about the time as an extra direction. This is the time. And you see when the ants collide, 
So you see this forms a plane. And now these collide, these form a plane, but this plane and that plane will have to be the same plane. And therefore these two lines are in the same plane. And therefore, since they are on the same plane, they will have to collide. So it's simple Euclidean geometry. So using simple geometry and just the fact that the plane, the plane that are made of two, three, and four, and one, three, and four are the same implies that the one and two must collide. And that's the abstraction. So just like in physics, we have to add time as an extra direction and that helps a lot, or just like as in string theory where we have these extra dimensions and they help a lot with properties of quantum gravity, this puzzle also shows to you that sometimes having extra direction resolves a lot of problems. And here I want to talk about another puzzle which illustrates a principle in physics called duality. Duality basically means that two seemingly different systems can nevertheless be identical. They look very different, but they could be the same. They have the same properties. They look very the same. They have the same physical properties. And this typically involves a change of perspective. So this, this drawing by Escher illustrates this. So if you look at this drawing, you would think that on the left side, there's, you know, the, there's a, there's a day, daylight and there's a sky and there's a black bird. But on the right side, you see it's the night sky and you see the white birds. Of course, if you go from right to left or left to right, the black bird gradually becomes the night sky and the white bird gradually becomes the white sky of the day. So, they, so we, in this language, you could think that the left and the right are dual to each other, but somehow the physics continuously changes from one picture to the other. And similarly from up to down, you see that the white birds become white parts of this uh, farm and the black birds are becoming black parts of this farm. And these dualities, which happen a lot in string theory and other areas of physics have been, I have this beautiful illustration using this drawing. But here I want to give you a puzzle about the duality. This is the puzzle. The puzzle is again about ants. We have one meter stick one meter and we put 20 ants on the meter stick and the ants are going with constant speed of one centimeter per second. The ants can go either to the left or to the right. But if two ants come and collide, they go revert their direction and they go backwards. They go whatever direction they were coming, they go the other way until they meet another ant and if they collide with another ant, then they go back again and so forth. So they go zigzag back and forth between any collisions. And the speed is always constant. The speed is always one centimeter per second, but the direction changes after each collision. Now, we are given one meter of the, of the uh, meter stick. And then when the ants collide after a while, they get to the bottom, at, they might get to the end of the meter stick. And when they get to the end of the meter stick, they just fall down like this. So you see here the ants collide and they go back in the other way, they collide, they go back the other way and so forth. And when they get to the very bottom, the very end of the meter stick, they fall off, okay? So this is the question I want you to answer. Where do you put these ants, these 20 ants, and which directions should, you, should they go initially? Do they go to the left or right? So as to maximize the time the last ant is on the meter stick. So that's what we want to know. We want to know where should we do, what should we do to put the ants so that the, the last ant is at the, uh, is at the, um, it falls off the latest, as late as possible. Those of you who think that we better put the ants close to the center and make them go back and forth so they collide as much as possible, put C for center. And those who think that's not the case, Say no, end for no. Okay. لدينا عصا طولها واحد متر. على هذه العصا وضعنا 12 نملة تسير بسرعة ثابتة واحد متر أو عفوا واحد سنتيمتر في الثاني. النملات تسير بحيث إنه إذا تصادمت نملتين سينعكس اتجاه سيرهما. يعني إذا تصادموا حترتد كل نملة باتجاه المعاكس للاتجاه اللي كانت ماشي فيه. 
السؤال اللي احنا رايقين والنمله اذا وصلت قبل السؤال النمله اذا وصلت لحافه المسطره او العصا حتسقط بعيدا عن المسطره السؤال اذا احنا بدنا نضع النملات في مكان بحيث نعظم الزمن اللي حتمضي على هذه المسطره يعني بدنا اياها تعيش اطول فتره ممكنه على المسطره وين لازم نوضع هذه النملات هل نضعها في مكان قريب من المركز من جاوب يا الحالي بحرف سي اذا لا برايكم في مكان اخر غير المركز او بعيد عن المركز ممكن نجاوب ب نو انه ليس الجواب الصحيح هو المركز Okay, so let's see the answers. علما انه بنذكر في حال تصادم النمله مع نمله اخرى حترجع باتجاه معاكس، حترتد وترجع برجوع. فوين لازم يكون المكان الانسب لوضع النمله؟ Okay, so most people are saying no. Okay. Yes. So now the next question is how many you think that if I just put one ant on the left and say go to the right, that's the answer. Doesn't matter what we do to the rest. Sorry, can you repeat the question, please? How many think the answer is that you just put one ant on the left and just tell it to go all the way to the right and you don't care what you do with the other 19 ants? How many think that's the answer? Mean you think that the job is right to put a number on the right side of the right side and turn it to the right side of the right side, regardless of the number of the right side. This is something that will remain the number of the right side. Whoever thinks it's yes, put Y, and the ones who think no, say N. اللي بيظن هذا الجواب صحيح يحط نعم يس او واي واللي بيشوف انه لا هذا جواب خاطئ يجاوب بنو اذا المقترح للاجابه على السؤال السابق انه يكون الحل هو نضع نمله على طرف المسطره اللي يكون الطرف اليساري ونوجهها تمشي باتجاه اليمين بغض النظر عن باقي النملات فهل هذا الجواب صحيح ولا لا؟ اوكي okay. so it seems like the majority of saying yes surprisingly and that is actually the correct answer so but let's see why. Why is it uh, doesn't matter the rest of them? The intuitive answer is that you put them in the middle and make them collide as much as possible. So that will be causing them to fall later because of the collision. They support each other. But somehow the answer is unintuitive. And you, all you have to do is put it one at the left and make it go to the right. And it doesn't matter where you put wherever else. And the reason is duality. Now, you might say, what does this have to do with duality? So to see what it has to do with duality, it is best to actually change the color of the ants so they are all black. If they are all black ants, when the ants are colliding, you don't know if they are going through each other or they are colliding backwards because there is no difference between the ants colliding and going through each other or going back. So the problems are dual to each other. Whether the, you, you do a transformation where the identity of the ant changes when they collide and they go the other directions or not where they pass through each other. So whether they pass through each other or whether they go like this, they are the same. And therefore, if you just put one at the end and go say, go to the right, even though it's colliding effectively, if you change the identity after each collision, it's gonna be the longest it's going to take and that's gonna be hundred seconds. So that's an example of duality. And so this is my final, uh, final puzzle I'm going to present, final topic. And I think uh, this is the a good way to end it because actually it will show us reflections of scientific methodology. In science, we start with examples, which are like experiments. And if we formulate a general principle based on the examples, and then we come up with arguments why it works or doesn't work, and then we repeat and do more experiments just to make sure we understood it correctly. So here together, we're going to do an experiment together. The experiment is the following. We have a circle. How many regions are inside the circle? Well, there's one region if there's nothing there. But suppose we do something interesting. Suppose we put two points and we connect them. How many regions do we get inside the circle? Well. If you put two points, you're getting two regions, one, two. In other words, with two points, you're getting two regions. Now, how about if you put three points, add one more point and connect to everybody else? Well, you get four regions. So in other words, with two points, you got two regions. With three points, you get four regions, okay? 
Okay, let's continue. How about four points? Now notice that I'm putting, I'm putting these points in a random place. I'm not putting them symmetrically. So just take a random point, a generic point. Suppose I put the fourth point and then connect it to every other point. How many regions do we get now? Well, we're gonna get eight regions. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. In other words, with four points, we get eight regions. Now we add one more point. How many regions are we gonna get? Please write the answer. Just type the answer. Can we show the previous table, please, again? The previous one? Yes, please. So it was four points, it was eight regions, and now we're asking about five points. Yes. When we had two points, we had four points, 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 Okay. So most of the answers is 16. Everybody says 16 and that's correct. And so the, the kind of reasoning is kind of natural. You see each time you're adding a point, you're doubling the number of regions. And so what's the reason for it? Well, the reason for it, you might think that, okay, you take each point and you connect it. Each region is either to the left or to the right. So it's a factor of two each time you add a point. Each region can be divided to whether it's on the left side or on the right side of this, and that's a factor of two. So suppose we add one more point, for example, how many regions do we get now? Can they write the answer? Okay, so everybody get the answer, 32, <laughs> amazing, amazing. So you see, you're not getting good, but actually I'm going to surprise you. The answer is 31. The answer is 31, not 32. We made the mistake, all of us made a mistake. So it does not double, it is 31. And it's not because I did any mistakes, you can count them yourself. So we came up with experiment, we come up with a theory, it was kind of working and we kind of made up a general principle was right up to five points. It made the prediction that 16 was working, but the next one failed. Our theory was wrong. We have to come up with the correct theory. So this is the power of experimentation. You see the experiment in this case showed us we were making a mistake. And the actual formula turns out to be, turns out to be this re relation. The number of regions is one plus the number of points choose two, plus the number of choice points choose four. And you can check that for up to five region points, it gives you 16 correct factors of two, but after that, it goes differently. So for example, if you have seven points, instead of 64, you're gonna get 57. So this is showing you that sometimes we have to continue doing experiments and the uh, understanding of nature always goes back and forth between checking it coming up with a theory, checking it again. And if you need, you have to modify it and somehow improve our understanding as we go along. So let me uh, just say that I hope I have conveyed the power of simple mathematical ideas in the context of physics. Even the most advanced ideas in string theory have simple mathematical underpinnings, just like the puzzles we have discussed today. Thanks for listening to my talk. Thank you, Professor Vafa. It was interesting puzzles. Most of the Thank time, you. it was surprising that the answer that we guessed was wrong. <laughs> Dr. Akram. Yes. So thank you so much, Professor Vafa, I mean, for this public talk and for the, um, I mean, useful interaction between you and the audience. Just, um, I want maybe, uh, maybe Ahmed, he missed up, I mean, the purpose or uh, the aims of this public talks, because as I said, professor, before in my email, most of them expected a technical um, talk about maybe string theory and swamp land. But as I uh, 
Professor Vafa said that there is two, I mean, kinds of uh, talks. One is for public, which is this one, the importance of uh, the mathematics or simple ideas and the relation between physics. And the other one will be scheduled after maybe two weeks from now about swampland uh, conjecture, which is, uh, I mean, more specialized and technical. Just, um, I will translate this for one minute for the audience, and I want to say something, and maybe if you want, we can open the floor for a few questions to the audience. Is it okay? Yes. For yes. Okay. Yes. So for the translation. Ikhwati al-kiram, yani, jazeel shukr lakum ankum, yani, hadartu ma'ana, al-hadaf min hatihi al-muhadara kan huwa, yani, al-tafa'ul ma bain, الأستاذ فافا ويعني المستمعين وعنده نوعين إن شاء الله من المحاضرات محاضرة عامة يعني لعامة الناس الرواد ومحاضرة للمتخصصين راح تكون ممكن بعد أسبوعين وراح تكون حول نظرية الأوطار وآخر أعماله اللي هي سوامبلان الآن الهدف من هذه المحاضرة هو يعني أراد أن يبين أن هناك أشياء معقدة في نظرية الأوطار الرياضيات معقدة ك يعني استخدام التناظر مبدأ التناظر اللي هو المبدأ المقدس في الفيزياء النظرية أو المبدأ الآخر اللي هو كسر التناظر أو يعني مفاهيم أخرى اللي هي الإزدواجية دواليتي التي تستخدم أيضا في أشياء أخرى في الفيزياء النظرية أو أيضا الأبعاد الإضافية التي أضيفت في نظرية الأوطار كل هذه المفاهيم المجردة والرياضية المعقدة ممكن وصلها الأستاذ فافا بالطريقة الغربية لأن الطريقة الغربية في دراسة الرياضيات هي التي ترونها الآن ليست الطريقة العربية اللي هي التعقيد في الرياضيات فتخلي الطالب يعني ينفر من الرياضيات ولكن هذه هي النظرة العميقة للرياضيات وتخلي الشخص لما يستخدمها بعدين يعني في الفيزياء أو في مجالات أخرى يعرف استعمالها ويتقنها فشكرا جزيلا للأستاذ فافا على هذه يعني يعني على تقريب هذه المفاهيم الرياضية المعقدة ويعني تبسيطها يعني للمستمع وتبيين أهميتها في مجال الفيزياء النظرية الآن نرجع فقط للأستاذ فافا يعني so, uh, Professor Vaf, I want to point out last point. So, um, just uh, I, um, uh, for mentioning um, in the Arabic world in general. So, we have, as I said uh, before, most of the Arabic uh, countries are colonized by French or uh, France or, I mean, Great Britain before. So, even doing mathematics or learning mathematics, we have two schools. I mean, uh, of thoughts. I mean, uh, in this, uh, um, in the Arabic world, we have the uh, Francophone-like uh, countries like um, Algeria, uh, Morocco, Tunisia, uh, and other countries, and we have Egypt and, uh, um, uh, for example, Yemen and uh, Emirates and the other countries. We are doing different kinds of math. So uh, today you are, I mean, uh, try to simplify uh, or to make the relation between uh, the math and the physics and the importance. But uh, um, why I mention these two uh, kind of schools? Because, for example, uh, for the Francophone uh, Arabic countries, they uh, do uh, what's called abstract mathematics. I mean, because, I mean, most of the um, French people likes, I mean, the abstract things. So we, um, uh, me, like for example, Algerian. I mean, uh, I adapt to use. Uh, I mean, uh, some, uh, uh, more complicated abstract mathematics. But for other countries like Egypt and uh, um, um, uh, other countries in the Middle East, they use maybe uh, the part to applied mathematics more. Just I point out this, uh, I mean, um, difference because when you discuss about abstraction or the importance of abstractions, I mean, in, uh, uh, I mean, in physics, but as I said, there is two uh, schools and even learning mathematics in uh, our schools is, uh, there is a division. Mm -hmm. So uh, just I want to point out this, uh, I, mean, uh, um, I mean, division in yes. Arabic. Yes. I think that this idea of abstraction versus not is, is not just in the not just in the Arab world in that context. I think in general, 
the the Burbaki school and you know the, the other schools and so on. There there are these different kinds of views of what mathematics is. So some some people view mathematics as starting from examples and kind of expanding from there. Some people start from the other way, the principles and abstract models, abstract uh, axioms, and then coming with the rest. So there are different kinds of perspectives. Of course, as a physicist, uh, we are less interested in mathematics and more interested in reality of around us. And mathematics comes to our aid to shed light on it. Uh, but mathematics is only viewed mostly as a tool, not as the ends in itself. Even though math is beautiful and math has elegant applications and all that, but from a physicist perspective, it's only a method to use it. However, in recent days, mathematics has not only become used as a tool, but also as motivating new physical ideas. And that is one of the new things that mathematical thinking has actually led to new physical questions and, and vice versa. New, new physical questions have led to new mathematics. And so this, this interesting interaction between physics and mathematics have reinforced these two fields and their interconnections in modern times. Something I could not do real justice to in this talk because of the complexity of this development in the past 30, 40 years, where math and physics are fusing in some ways into one field, or even though they have different emphases, they're really interacting very strongly with each other. And I should just say that uh, I have not had the pleasure to visit too many Arab countries, unfortunately. I've been to, to Morocco and I've been to Egypt, uh, but I haven't been to many of the other countries and uh, of course uh, I would love to see them. And uh, I know a lot of the words that you were using in, in translating my talk because I use them in Farsi, mm -hmm. but uh, many of our words in Farsi are Arabic, of course. So therefore I understood the words. I wish I could put the words so I could say Morabba, Taqaron and all that, but I couldn't use the, use the uh, uh, correct, correct uh, connection. So therefore I'm, I felt a bit embarrassed that I couldn't do that, but at any rate, uh, I look forward to any questions you have. I'm, I'm open to questions. If you have questions in English, you can ask in English. If you don't feel comfortable in English, you can raise your question in Arabic and they will be kindly translated by our host. And I will be glad to answer either one. And if you can uh, open your videos when you're asking a question, that would be great. If you don't like to open your videos, that's your choice, that's fine too. But I think you, should, you have the option uh, of opening up your videos if you want to ask questions and I prefer to see your faces. I'd be happy because with the Zoom, everything is too abstract. I want a little bit less abstract the Zoom connection. Even though math can be abstract, the Zoom should be very concrete. <laughs> you, you were calling for abstraction. Now you change your mind. <laughs> الكاميرا <تصفيق> يستحي أو لا يريد أن يفتح هذا يعني لا توجد مشكلة الأسئلة بالإنجليزية أو بالعربية إذا كانت بالإنجليزية يعني عادي إذا كانت بالعربية أنا أو الأخ أحمد سيترجمها ويعني ونترجم أيضا الإجابة فتفضلوا إخوتنا الكرام نحن تحت أمركم موجودون هنا يعني. تمام نبدأ مع الأستاذ حسين الخالدي <تصفيق> Uh, welcome, Dr. Bava. Thank you. Uh, uh, I have uh, one question, please. Uh, if uh, discovered uh, an extra diminution, uh, uh, can help calculate, uh, can it help calculate the amount of dark matter? Mm -hmm. Can we calculate the amount of dark matter? We do, yes. not, know en we do not know enough about dark matter. Uh, so even in string theory, there are different kinds of dark matters that can arise. And we do not know which one is the one in our universe. Therefore, currently we, we do not have a first principle derivation of dark matter. So we, I, unfortunately the answer to your question is no with our current knowledge. And it's possible that there could have existed different kinds of universes consistent with, with observation with different amounts of dark matter. So we do not know if the answer had to be unique. But at any rate, with current technology, we don't have any a priori prediction of dark matter other than what observation tells us. 
Thank you, Professor. سؤال التالي من الأستاذ إبراهيم. تفضل أستاذ إبراهيم. Yeah, thank you so much, Professor. Thank you. Thank you. So maybe I have two or three questions. The first question yes. is, uh, what is the mathematical demonstration uh, or the mathematical function of a uh, electron jumping from an orbit to another? Because we know the electron when it jumps from an orbit to another, it's not, it doesn't uh, go in a continuous path. So will the function be uh, discontinuous or what will be the mathematical demonstration for, for the path of this electron? Well, the electron continues smoothly, but, uh, but not, not the classical picture of the orbit. So when you draw a classical orbit, that is jumping. But, but actually what happens in quantum mechanics is there's a wave function. And the wave function is electron is, is in different configurations and it can make it transition from one to the other smoothly. So therefore it's not as, it's not as abrupt as it sounds. So it's a kind of a gradual process, but there's a transition. Now, so in the quantum, in the context of quantum mechanics, the wave function, the wave function is smoothly evolving using a, so, and the wave function in the context of the electron is the probability to find the electron in different places. That wave function is smoothly transitioning from one to the other. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, the last question is, uh, the last question is uh, if we apply force or a mass into the fabric of space-time. Will space-time, uh, can we apply like the Newton third law on the space-time? So when we apply a force or a mass on the fabric of the space of the space-time, we have an inverse force from it. So you cannot think about. So the way you're asking a question presupposes that there's there's a fabric here and there's something you're pushing on it. It's not like that. The fabric of the space-time is not like a even though I was drawing pictures which look like you know, a, a, a membrane or something and the object is sitting on it, it's not like that. I was just trying to draw it. What's actually happening, if I could draw it, was that these are part of the space. So the atoms and these planets and all that are part of it. It's kind of in the middle of it. You cannot remove it. You cannot push it out and in. It's not external. It's mm -hmm. part of the whole system. So, and as far as the Newton's third law, the Newton's third law is automatically incorporated into the into the what we call the Lagrangian mechanics. It's just the fact that there is potential between objects which arises in general, and so there's no you don't you don't have a force anti force kind of backward forces. So so that's some automatic feature of Lagrangian mechanics. And Einstein's theory, which is based on an action principle, it just follows that same paradigm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Professor. We have uh, like two questions about the formula that you used about the regions yes. in the circle. How can we derive this formula? And also asking about the formula for the movement of ants on the stick. Okay, so uh, let's see. So you're asking about you're asking about this formula. Yes. So this formula is um, basically. It has three steps. First of all, if you have if you have no points, then clearly there's one region. Mm, That's kind of yes. obvious. Now, each time you add an end, you have to choose for each line you're drawing. For each line you're drawing, you have to choose out of these. If you have n points, there are n choose two lines you can draw. Mm -hmm. And each time you draw a line, you get one extra region. That's why this is. But it turns out that for every four points. When you draw the lines, there's one other region you get when the lines cross each other, because for every four pairs of points, there's a crossing happens. And mm -hmm. that's the reason that N choose four. So these are the three mechanism. And to argue that these, this is it, and there's nothing else you need to think a little, but this is the origin of this formula. Mm -hmm. And notice Perfect. that this goes like a fourth power of N, and therefore it's not exponential in N, and that's why it stops. It doesn't grow exponentially as fast. Mm -hmm. so that was one question. And the other one was, which, which other, the ant, you said which ant? The ant on the yeah. stick, the formula for the ant on the stick. Is there any formula about describing their movement? Which one, this one or yes. which one? The ant on the stick, yeah, this is a very simple formula. It ants go with a constant speed. Mm -hmm. So therefore, if they are colliding, you can ignore the fact that they collide and they just continue through each other as long as you change the identity of the ant. Exactly. 
So therefore, there's no, no, this formula is just, if you are not interested in the identity of the ant, and we are not, then the answer is that you just go continuous. It's like X equals to X zero plus VT. Very simple. Okay. <coughs> Hi, thanks, Professor, for, for your uh, interesting talk. Um, uh, since Dr. Akram uh, has pointed out the point for um, the education for physics and mathematics. Yes. And I have noticed that here in North America, there are a lot of excellent Iranian students and professors. And um, I have been told that uh, 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 it has been beloved, uh, the education for physics and mathematics, over the maybe past 30 years or more in Iran. So if you can just tell us how how did you do that? Or um, it's, it's it's maybe it's a long question, but if you can answer this or give us um, simple points about this. Yes, I understand. It's a very important question. You see, uh, both for both for the Arab world and the Iran and and the nearby countries, we have to advance, the, improve the science. Unfortunately, we we have ways to go. Both Iran and nearby countries, Arab countries. I think science is not as good as it could be. And um, that's a fact. And uh, especially given the, given the golden era of, uh, of science during the Islamic civilization and all the period that you know, there was this renaissance of all these activities, it is a pity that that kind of activity is not happening in our region that much. So what's happened in Iran, I think is, the, is twofold. First of all, there are people like myself who, who came to study outside Iran and we got our education in the Western uh, universities. I studied at MIT and Harvard, uh, at MIT and Princeton and now I'm at Harvard. And so that's what, one thing I did and other people do other things. But then there's also homegrown physics, which is many of our, my colleagues went back to Iran and they started having a PhD programs. And as of 20, 30 years ago, they have been, uh, they have been having a very relatively strong programs in different universities in Iran to try to advance science. Now, they have achieved good results in the sense that they have, they have managed to kind of produce nice work. They may not be at the forefront of doing, you know, breakthrough works, but, you know, they, they write reasonably good papers and uh, they follow what's going on outside. And I think that if other countries, uh, nearby countries, countries in the Arab world, it can gradually up the scale by, by interaction between people who are outside and people who are in, inside. So I think it's a good idea to have both people out and inside so they communicate. Mm -hmm. And also a regional kind of environment where regions have conferences and help each other. Uh, it'd be good for science in the region. It will also be good for cooperations between the countries because science you know, has really no borders. Thankfully, we are kind of just I would say that science is the proof that humanity is one thing and you know there's no border to the science. And so it's a good model for teaching you know, the politicians that we, we do not want divisions, we want unifications of, of, of people and we have no barriers. We really uh, have a lot in common and, and less, in, uh, less division. And so that we should emphasize. And I think science is an amazingly important vehicle bring, bring all these different cultures together and and uh, for a good cause for understanding and for improvement of humanity. Uh, so I think that there's a good reason to try to push it in all these countries. So unfortunately, <clears throat> the funding for these areas are, are difficult to get for. And so somehow from each country, we should try to help motivate the public to bring pressure on politicians and to governments to kind of de devote a good amount of money or a good amount of support towards development of science, both fundamental science and applied science and the connections between them. We hope things getting better. <laughs> Inshallah. Inshallah. <laughs> yes, hi. Uh, it's an honor to be with you, Professor. Thanks to the organizers. And Thank sorry you. for not opening my camera as I wasn't prepared. No problem. I'm not specialized, uh, but of course interested in the field. My question is, uh, does quantum entanglement include all states, probabilities of the object? And related to, uh, to that, uh, what's your opinion about uh, multi-universe? Thank you. Quantum mechanics is the probability of, 
all probably I didn't completely understand the first question. So, One so the thing, entanglement. It's an entanglement, you mean? Yes, true entanglement. It's entanglement of what? What's the question exactly? So a measurement is a kind of entangling of. So quantum mechanics is is various constituent things, and so once you do a measurement, you're you're getting an entangled state between what you're observing and what you're not observing. So the entanglement is a part of the resulting of an experiment in quantum mechanics. So that's true. So you have an entangled state when you're doing measurements in quantum mechanics. And the other question was what again? It's, uh, about uh, multi-universe. Multi uh, yes, sorry. About my first question. Uh, the entanglement is uh, like uh, it's a wave or uh, as you say, molecules. So is it like all probabilities that the object or the matter can be? It only like a wave or a molecule. If it has more probabilities to be, would it be including in the entanglement? Everything should be included in the entanglement, every degree of freedom. So for whatever you're describing the physical system, you should include all the degrees of freedom. If it's spin, if it is a position, if it's momentum, whatever, that's part of the entanglement. Now, as far as the multi-universe, uh, there are two different questions about multi-universe you may be asking. One is in the context of the many history world or many world uh, interpretation of quantum mechanics that's one question you could ask or the multi-universe in the context of string theory or the existence of would-be universes that could exist in parallel and they, they, they might be in fact deep connection between the two pictures also we don't know but let me answer the second question which is closer to my heart which is in string theory we have discovered that there are many possible consistent universes and therefore in principle these universes could exist not just one universe that we know of, but other ones. And so whether they have any existence in parallel or not is a question that is not clear. The only question that, the only way you would know it is if there's an interaction between universes. And if they have interactions, then it's again one universe. So, so the question is a little bit difficult to assess because uh, the existence of would-be universes should be possible but whether or not they happen at the same time or whether there's any parallel one in the sense that right now I can assess this other universe. And if it is, then isn't it part of my universe to begin with or what? And so that becomes the major question, which is not clear. Professor, for the first questions, when he asked about entanglement, I mean, when, uh, and you answer his question. So, I think uh, concerning the interpretation, when you answer his question, you look like you are on the side of the mini world interpretation because you consider uh, if we are in Copenhagen interpretation, we don't have entanglement. We have the measurement and the collapse of the wave function, but in uh, mini world interpretation, we have it and uh, the observer, then the, the measurement process. So um, am I yeah. right? About well, many word interpretation, sorry, many word interpretation uh, and the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics are not different. They're just different. Uh, I mean, they sound different, but I think they can be related to each other. I don't think they have different physical, you can't do an experiment to distinguish them. So therefore, to me, the, the two things are in some sense the same because there's no physics difference between them. There's no physics experiment which could distinguish. So, so it's kind of a psycho psychological view of it. But I think that uh, to me, as a practicing physicist, I still am not happy with the measurement theory of quantum mechanics. So I think that uh, still there are many people who feel that there's quantum mechanics is enigmatic, is mysterious, and quantum mechanics measurement theory is still there leaves something to be desired. So I don't think that we have still gotten to the bottom of it. Mm -hmm. We have a practical definition of what the experiment is. And that's fine for now, but that doesn't mean I, I think we have we are finished with the subject. Okay. So I'm in Ustaz Al Hassan. Fadal. First of all, I I would like to thank uh, I would like to thank you, sir, for lecturing our art community. Uh, I have I actually two main questions. My first one is about. Uh, when you were talking about the regions in the circle puzzle, you, would, yes. you said like, we have like, when we come when we came to the 16, uh, and when 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 we proceed to uh, 31, sorry, to the 31, you said we have to do another experiments and experiments like to get the real 
the, the really thing, uh, thing that it ha happens uh, there. My question is, uh, what, is the what is the point when we can say this is the end of the experiments? I mean, like, maybe we can go forever, which, like, we know, this is, we can do infinite numbers of regions. Yes, yes. So, then, so, there are, so that's what we do. In physics, we don't stop experimenting. There are things we are more sure of, and there are things we are less sure of. Things which are more sure of, we don't do experiment again and again. There are things which are, we are less sure of, and we do experiment more and more. So, so my point here with this puzzle is, of course, we know the final answer here is this. So we are done, finished. We can mathematically prove it. And we don't do any more experiments. We know this is the answer. But here, I was just giving an analogy, really, to try to say that a physicist is like somebody who still has not discovered this formula. We don't know this formula, and we cannot prove it. But we come up with a theory of how this is changing. And then we will always have to be kind of skeptical that we are making a mistake. And so somehow we get surprises like this one. So for example, when Einstein came up with the theory of relativity, like the time dilation or the length contraction, these were surprises. Newton would not have agreed with this formulas that Einstein would be writing, but it's true. So therefore for, for Newton, what Einstein found is like 31 instead of 32. So there are these kind of things that when we delve more, we learn more. For example, what we are now doing compared to what Einstein was doing is again, another 31. So we were learning things in string theory, which are very surprising from Einstein's perspective. And so again, it was surprising to Einstein. So string theory or physics in general continues on previous work and it's not gonna stop, at least not in our lifetime. It doesn't look like we are getting to the end of it. I don't think we are ever gonna to get to this kind of formula like this for the full physics, at least I don't see it. And for now, it's like getting step by step and improving it, but always checking just to make sure we haven't made a mistake or the theory is not is not uh, is not is correct or not, and trying to find a better theory. So that's why we can see that science is an endless endeavor. It seems to be endless right now. Whether that changes or not, at least from our perspective today, it seems endless. So we'll find out. Okay. Uh, so there's no yes. I have just one question for me and last question i mean uh, and if uh, professor hello so uh, professor many people ask me i mean um, for example about the state of string theory uh, right now especially if you go for example if you contemplate on um, institute for advanced study members and i think you were also a member in uh, ias before I mean, there is like a division, I mean, between the abstraction or using the mathematical tools and advanced mathematical tools like uh, Edward Witten and the others and the, uh, the other people like Maldesina and Nima Arkani Hamd who use some tools, I mean, in string theory to solve some problems, actual problems or puzzles in, uh, because why I'm asking this you uh, are discussing today about the necessity of the mathematics and uh, some, uh, I mean, um, advanced tools in um, math and why you use it. Uh, but s some people like, uh, for example, Edward Witten right now use some um, advanced tools, like for example, no theory, Kovanov homology and other tools, I mean, the tools from mathematics and break it back to uh, physics and try to relate it with gauge theories. And do you think this is, uh, are you, uh, uh, I mean, with this path, I mean, or um, because you are discussing with the necessity of mathematics, but do you think that Edward Witten and this new mathematics or this uh, kind of mathematics is useful, I mean, in physics or it's not yes. the right So path? I think the question you're asking is a good question. To what extent the math has taught us about physics, not just mm -hmm. abstract physics, but concrete applied physics. And I think that will be related to the talk I will give in two weeks. In two weeks, I will explain why these abstract math ideas have taught us concrete facts about cosmology, about particle physics, and about our universe. So that's what I will postpone answering your question maybe in two weeks when I talk about the ideas related to fundamental physics and swampland. I'll try to explain what have we learned in string theory. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Interesting. Says Yusuf. 
تفضل سؤالك السلام عليكم وعليكم السلام السلام عليكم اوكي جود ايفنينج بروفيسور جود ايفنينج ماي كويستشن از اباوت سبيس تايم كيرفتشر يس كان اي اسك اباوت ات بليز اوكي The space type curvature, the shape represents a space type curvature. Otherwise, uh, drawing as a grid um, uh, contain many many squares. And when we ask about this uh, this uh, shape, uh, the origin of this shape, the answer will be uh, the shape is represent the space type curvature in one dimension. Okay. My uh, my question is, is that the difficult or or impossible to draw uh, uh, to draw an, a, a figure represent the space type curvature? Uh, in three dimensions, I, I don't mean I don't mean the fourth uh, the, the fourth the dimension the time the time is imaginary that's okay, I I I, I mean uh, the, the shape represents the three dimension of space time curvature. Well, you can kind of, what is the curvature is that the lengths do not appear the way they do. So let me explain what I would mean. For example, the three dimension uh, we live in three dimensions. Okay. So let's, let's just look at it. So you can get so for example a rod this way this way and this way to try to make a square. So in the, if, if there's no curvature, when you go up and down and up and down, you go back to the same point. So the fact that if you go up and then up and then down and left and right and you four, four 90 degrees angles, you don't come back to yourself is the reason you have curvature. That has, that's true in any dimension. So you can kind of, so if you, if you go, for example, one meter to the right, one meter up, one meter to the left, and one meter down, you don't end up the same place. So instead of getting a square, you get a four-sided object, which is not a square. That to me is curvature. And I'm drawing it for you, right? I'm just drawing it. Just draw this line. You just see there's a curvature. Now, people, when they try to do the curvature in the form that you're telling me about, about drawing curves and so on, trying to, they're trying to emphasize the fact that straight lines are not necessarily straight anymore in the coordinate, which you might naively use they look a little like curve. Even though they are geodesic, meaning shortest distance, the shortest distance goes on a curve. So you could do the same in our universe if it's curvature, you can go in some direction and see which, where do you end up if you go straight. If you go straight, you may not be straight up, it might be shortest distance, it might be curving. And so that's why they draw it sometimes like curved lines. So curved lines are denoting the fact that geodesics, the shortest distance are not straight lines, but curved. Thank you, Professor. You're welcome. So, I'll tell you, Mr. Brahim, Brahim Bayer. Yeah, thank you again, Professor. My You're question welcome. this time is a little bit uh, philosophical. Like, uh, uh, can we be sure that our mathematics will work in every in every region of our universe? Well, mathematics is a logical statement. So, so anything which so, so anything which is governed by the rules of logic will have some kind of mathematics. Now, you could ask, could it be that our universe is not logical? Well, that, that would be something for me too difficult to even contemplate. What would it mean? Something that's not logical means that's not real, real in some form. So for me, any reality is, is preconditioned to be logical. Otherwise, it wouldn't exist. So therefore, any reality should be related to some, some form of a logical statement. Now, uh, whether there's going to be the math we have understood or discovered is a different statement. We may not have learned the correct math yet, but math is basically this, the abstract definition or the philosophical definition of mathematics is the study of all possible logical structures. In that sense, it should apply to physical reality of any form. Uh, Yes, uh, first I would like to thank you all. And uh, my question is about uh, the relationship between physics and math. Is physics interested in developing mathematics? I mean, in string theory, it uses co a complicated math. Does the development of physics depend uh, on the development of math or current math is uh, sufficient? Thank no, good question, uh, Mohammed. Indeed, the development of physics does depend on development of new mathematics. The current mathematics is not enough. And I would say the opposite is also true. The development of mathematics depends on physics. 
And uh, so it's not what, so it's surprising that this is a two way street that new ideas of physics, surprisingly, surprisingly, have impacted pure mathematics, not applied mathematics, pure mathematics. Questions that you would ask about abstract mathematics have ended up being solved or replied to or, or shed light by asking concrete physical questions. So I think it's a symbiotic relationship between physics and mathematics has been growing in the past 20, 30 years. And now in some sense, some people believe that we are converging to one field. Interesting. Uh, hello, Professor. Hello. Uh, I want to thank you first, you and the organizer for this interesting lecture. Uh, English is not my first language, so just I will ask my question in English. Your English I will is better than my from... Arabic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I will order from Mr. Ahmed to translate the answer. Okay, so no understand problem. it well. Uh, I want to ask you how does the quantum physics might relate to string theory in a simple way? I want just a simple example. How does quantum mechanics correspond to simple physics? Well, it's not simple. <laughs> Sorry, Professor, not simple. String theory. How we can Sorry, relate what's between the question quantum again, mechanics? Then I the question. What's the question? Repeat the, it. The relationship between quantum mechanics and the string theory. Oh, yes. So I misunderstood. Sorry about it. Uh, string theory, quantum mechanics is part of string theory. So in other words, nothing changes in the context of string theory when you talk about quantum mechanics. The same laws of quantum mechanics which apply to particle physics also apply to strings. Mm -hmm. Just like when you talk about the probability of finding particle here or there as a wave function in the usual quantum mechanics, in string theory, you talk about probability of finding a string here or there or so on. So the, the same laws of quantum mechanics still apply. So we have not learned new things about quantum mechanics itself from string theory. And in fact, all the principles of quantum mechanics we knew before seem to be working very nicely in, in string theory. So, uh, so yeah, that's what it is. I wish we could say that we have learned something very specific about string about quantum mechanics like measurement theory or something, but nothing, we haven't learned anything we did not know before in the context of uh, string theory. Everything about quantum mechanics is as before. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Professor. Uh, I would like to ask a question by myself. Yes. Uh, you mentioned something about uh, the e-shirt drawings, and yes. it was like an explanation about the relationship between string theory and what you called corner theories. Yes. Can you explain this uh, this a little bit more? Sure. Let me just uh, share it again. Uh, to uh, referring to this picture here, mm -hmm. so. Here you see this drawing, you just have one drawing as a whole. Mm -hmm. So this is like a reality that we have in physics. In, in the context of string theory, these different corners or different parameters correspond to changing parameters in the theory. So for example, going from left to right would correspond to changing the radius of one circle. Mm -hmm. And going from down to up is changing the shape of another circle. So one corner means like you have shrunk one circle and grown another circle. And another corner means you're shrunk the other circle and grown the other one and so forth. They look totally different, but actually just by changing the sizes and going maneuvering, by going from one to the other, you can continuously do so. So the physics, you would say they are dual to each other in some sense, they look like each other, but they have different meanings in each one. So what you call black is white, what you call white is black, but otherwise they're moving, the other one is moving and so on. So there's, there are, there's a mathematical isomorphism between left and right. Mm -hmm. and so that happens in the context of string theory in the same form. That's why we can consider the physical theories as a different manifestation of the string theory. Exactly, different mm -hmm. theories, exactly. So different theories could be viewed as different corners here and you can go from any point to any other one. So they look like different theories, but they actually are the corners are, are extreme limits of a single theory. And this idea of what we call the uh, unification or wahdat, I guess in Arabic, of all these theories into one thing, all the uh, theories fitting to one one is, is demonstrated by this duality or this Escher drawing. 
Okay. Uh, one more question, please. What if we discover that string theory is a theory of everything? What's next? Is a, what is next? Well, we, it's being a theory of everything is not the whole thing. We have to understand what that means. We believe string theory is theory of everything, but we still don't know a lot about it. So, uh, so we, we, we know about very few corners. We haven't understood most of this landscape here. Uh -huh. We have just a little bit here, we know a little bit there and so on. So saying that, yeah, we know this is the correct, correct drawing, but we haven't explored or it's very difficult to explore it. I don't think we are going to be able to that quickly understand it. It's very complicated. Okay, thank you. The last question is, uh, answer Doha, Fadali. Swell akhir haikoon. Hello, Professor. I would like to ask a question about momentum. Yes. Why uh, momentum equal mass times velocity? Why is it uh, momentum is here, equal to mass time velocity? Yes. Uh, here I have two examples. Uh, the first example is about two ob uh, objects. Uh, the first object is uh, two kilogram, and the uh, second object is one kilogram. Yes. Uh, so if uh, uh, both of these objects move by in a constant velocity equal two meter per second. Yes. So if I consider the the object who is uh, two kilo uh, two kilogram is a system of particles, uh, um, it contains two particles. Each uh, particle is one kilogram. So the amount of motion of this object is double of the amount of motion of the second object. But I have here uh, the second example, which I have uh, the question about. The first uh, object is one kilogram. It moves in a constant velocity equal four meter per second, and uh, the second object is one kilogram. It moves in a uh, constant velocity equal two meter per second. So, why is um, is in the equal velocity? Why it um, uh, affect on uh, the amount of motion? Well, the amount of motion can appear in different ways. So you are so so. You, let me rephrase your question. Suppose you have two objects of mass, uh, let's say one, each one going with speed two. The the momentum is the same as one object with mass one going with speed four, right? That's what you're asking. It doesn't mean they are the same physical situation. Nobody said that if I gave you momentum, there is a unique possibility. There are different ways you can get the same momentum. Momentum does not define the physical system. In fact, this is just one parameter in that theory. So therefore, they didn't have to be the same. So, and they're different situation. It could be that, for example, the following could happen. It could be that the objects would collide with each other or not, or uh, do some other property that have different features. So the system which has a mass two uh, and velocity two, each, each one two is different from mass one, velocity four. And one difference between them is that their energy is different. Energy is mc squared. So for example, they, they can distinguish them. One of them has the energy basically mc squared, which is the, the rest mass is much smaller in the first, in one case, and the other one is much bigger. So they're different. Mm -hmm. um, can we have more two questions or? Sure, I'm, I, I, I can have uh, two more questions, sure. Okay, okay. Estaz uh, Amr, Fadal. By the way, Ahmed, by the way, just yes. please focus on the shot. I mean, because there is many women, I mean, ask and they are shy, I mean, to ask professor directly, because I saw I think many questions on the shotting. So please check uh, also uh, in the shot. I, I would, before you say it, let me just say that I would love questions from women because they're smarter than us. And I think that if they teach us by good questions, maybe we can help us. And I think that an example is Maryam Mizahani, the Iranian uh, woman who got yeah, the Fields Medal, and she's the only woman who has gotten the Fields Medal. So I think, I think I have a great deep respect for the the women scientists, and I don't think science depends on gender; it's a genderless issue. So I hope, I really hope that the women join us in helping more and more uh, development of science. I think uh, science can can benefit greatly from their presence. So anyhow, please, uh, women, I. Welcome, any questions you may have. Okay, uh, um, we covered actually the questions on the chat, so if they yes, want- Yes, they can, to... and, and if, if any woman is trying to ask a question and they're shy in terms of turning on their video, they don't have to turn on the video if sure. they, they feel shy about it. But anyhow, the chat is fine too. Okay. 
استاذ عمرو اتفضل استاذ عمر كان عندك سؤال طيب نشوف استاذ محمد تفضل السلام عليكم يعطيكم العافيه جميعا وعليكم السلام تفضل أه بالاول او ان ذا فيرست اي وود ثانك بروفيسور بافا ثانك يو ان توكينج اباوت ريليشن شيب بين فيزكس اند ماثيماتكس ماي كويستشن اباوت بوسيبيليتي اوف ابلاينج ماثيماتيكال ساينس ان فيزيكال موديلز What do you think of applying fractional calculus in physics? Well, I, I'm not aware of much applications of that, so I cannot say much about it. So, but I think that any piece of math which is interesting might end up use, being used in physics in some form. So usually consistent structures somehow translate to applications, but some of them have more applications, some of them have less. Of course, it doesn't mean that if the math is simple, it cannot be deep physics. For example, I'll give you one example. Take linear algebra. Linear algebra can be you know, a little boring math, like matrices and so on. But Einstein's theory of special relativity is just linear algebra. The mathematics of special relativity is almost boring. But the physics is amazing. You know, Length contraction, time dilation, energy is equal to mass c squared. So, so simple mathematics doesn't necessarily mean boring physics. Sometimes the other way. So therefore, Any consistent math may or may not end up being having deep or exciting applications. We should just be open to it. I'm not any familiar for any applications of the kind you asked. So. Okay. Uh, with the great expansion uh, of mathematics, what is the most important science uh, of mathematics for physicists? Well, we have learned not to pick just one area of mathematics. It turns out that if you're asking what have been the areas of mathematics today that are being used in physics today, I can tell you things involving, for example, of course, beginning with Newton's work on calculus and differential equations. They were the original ways they came up, but more modern applications of topology and uh, differential topology, differential geometry have become more important uh, and still they're growing. I mean, for example, in quantum information theory, new ideas of mathematics and physics are melding together. And so it's not easy to predict. And moreover, in string theory, issues from number theory have come up. So connections with number theory are showing up here and there. So it's not easy to predict where they are, uh, where, where, where what will come in. So when a student comes and asks me what math they should study, I tell them study as much as you can. Mm -hmm. uh, the last question that we got on chat is, is there a summary like one page include the most important equations in quantum and string theory? Uh, no, the answer is no. But that I summary, and it's not like like Maxwell's equation where you have one equation or four equation, whatever that everything is summarized. If we have not understood string theory in such a simple form, of course, it's our deficiency. Hopefully, there is a simple summary, but it's still a work in progress, and hopefully, we'll get to a situation where where we have a more uh, more deeper understanding of uh, of aspects of it. Uh, before I forget, I, I, I didn't mention at the beginning of my talk, I, I have given a number of public lectures uh, as well as uh, my more technical papers and so on on my website, which I put uh, on, the, on the chat. If for anybody who wants to take a look at the website, there are many more connections for more, 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 both more technical as well as more less technical lectures and talks. Thank you, Professor. Thank you a lot for this interesting interview, this interesting and amazing lecture. And shocking, you, actually, you. in some facts. <laughs> so thank I would you, like, yes. Yeah, uh, Dr. Akram, uh, can you close the lecture, please? Dr. Akram, can you hear me? Okay. So again, thank you, Professor. Shukran uh, lijameel hudur. على حضورهم ومشاركتهم في هذه المحاضرة واللقاء الرائع فاجأنا دكتور بافا بالكثير من الحقائق التي كانت تخالف ما توقعناه من إجابات نسأل الله أن تكون الجلسة مفيدة وممتعة لكم ونلقاكم إن شاء الله في لقاءات أخرى Again, thank you professor See you soon hopefully in other lectures Thank you very much for everybody who, who are here for listening and I hope to see you 
in two weeks virtually and maybe not in too distant a future in actual in countries yes. that yeah, we I'd so. love to visit uh, all, all these amazing uh, countries and cultures over there. We Thanks again so. for listening to my talk. Thank you. Thank you again. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.